let's get this started. Um, I want to welcome you all uh, to the M Mushroom Mixos and more webinar. Um, we are so happy that you have all joined us today on Sunday for this webinar, just to learn a little bit more about what Christian and Allison are going to be doing with our five-day retreat on Madeline Island. Before I get started, I'll let you guys all know that this will be recorded. So if something comes up while this webinar is going on, not to worry, go ahead and take care of it. We'll send out a recording to everyone that has registered for this webinar. Um, as we get started, let me go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Annie Meach Sumner, and I am the director at Madeline Island School of the Arts, also known as MISA. We are a top-ranked school in the nation, one of the top-ranked schools in the nation. Uh, we opened our doors in 2012, and it's hard to believe that we've only been in operations for 12 years. We have increased our size and added three more wonderful locations. Currently, we have our Tucson campus at the Tonka Verde Ranch in Tucson, Arizona. The Santa Fe campus is located at a historic Hilton right in downtown Santa Fe. And we recently added our Bar Harbor campus in the fall at the Atlantic, Atlantic Oceanside Resort. Um, this specific workshop that we're gonna be discussing is located at our flagship campus on Madeline Island. Things to know about Madeline Island. It is an amazing five-day retreat on our campus. We provide comfortable private rooms. Uh, we serve gourmet food that we were just talking about earlier. Um, and the island is really known for its unique environment and perfect ecosystem for mushrooms, mix us, and more. Um, I just wanna, before I uh, pass this over, to our wonderful co-hosts. I just want to introduce uh, Allison Pollack. She's joining us from Northern California. And Christian Schwartz is joining us from California. If you don't already know them before this, which is probably why you registered for this workshop, you're going to get to know a lot more about them at the end of this uh, about 60 minute webinar that we're going to, go going to host. And without further ado, oh, I do want to say if you have questions, please type them into our chat box or into our question and answers box. We will have some time afterwards to um, go through and answer any of those questions you might have. Without further ado, I'm going to pass this off to Christian and Allison. Please take it away. Thank you so much. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, everyone can see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to start this presentation you'll hear more about who Allison and I are in the next couple slides um but just uh the basic background is right, right here on the screen where and when early September um and now we're going to tell you what we'll be doing during that time period so Allison why don't you go ahead uh, before we do that we'll introduce ourselves um I'm Allison Pollock I've been photographing mushrooms and slime molds otherwise known as mixomycetes or mixos for about six years, I've been uh, I've always loved photography and I've photographed my most of my life, mostly with simple point and shoot cameras. But as I was hiking and started noticing mushrooms more and then discovered slime molds, I just decided I really wanted to learn how to photograph them. So I've been doing that for about six years. I'm completely obsessed with what I do. I, I go into the forest as much as I possibly can. I love taking photographs. I love showing the beauty of these organisms to people and get them interested in seeing these kinds of things that are right at your feet as you walk through the forest floor. I specialize in macro photography, which is photography of small things, although I certainly take plenty of photos of quote unquote normal sized mushrooms, big mushrooms. Um, but I really like, I tend to focus on the smaller organisms, smaller mushrooms and slime molds, which are really tiny. It's an example of a slime mold on the top right. Um, I uh, have taught a fair number of classes. I taught the, this class at Madeline Island last year, and I had a great time, which is why I'm doing it again this year and I invited Christian to join me. And um, I've had some photographs published in various uh, publications. Uh, National Geographic just bought three of my photos for use uh, for, for showing in two of their books that are coming out this year, and I've won some awards. That's enough about me, and I'll let Christian introduce himself. And just to just to 
drive the point home for those of you keeping score. Uh, most people don't uh, get their photos pub or published in National Geographic in six years. So Allison comes in a little, little below the average of um, the average age of the photographers um, or length of photography. So it's very impressive. Um, Thank you. I, I knew Allison. When did we meet Allison? I don't know how many uh, years. About ago. five years ago. Yeah. So right when you were taking off on this exponential rocket. Uh, of photography that you've been writing. Um, okay, so I um, have come to the world of mushrooms and slime molds in a bit of a different route from Allison. I was first uh, captivated by their biodiversity and beauty from a sort of an identification perspective, a little bit more um, learning to recognize them is what, what first captured my interest. And that was in 2004 uh, in high school in San Diego. And um, I moved after that to Central California to go to college where I was told UC Santa Cruz was in the middle of the forest and I would be able to go mushroom hunting between classes. And that's exactly what I did. I, I ditched classes and went mushroom hunting instead. Um, and over the course of that sort of, you know, decade of familiarizing myself with the mushrooms of California, I got so obsessed that I decided I needed to write some books to help other people recognize mushrooms. And so my co-author, Noah Siegel, who some of you may have heard of, um, he and I uh, published a book called Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast in 2016. And um, over the course of doing the field work for that book, we ended up taking thousands and thousands of photos. And we got quite good at um, a particular style of photography that we'll certainly be teaching you about um, while we're there. But I did also get um, experience with uh, a variety of, of styles of photography that we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, but after I was done teaching the or writing this book with Noah, um, I spent a lot more time teaching people um, about mushroom ecology, mushroom biodiversity in general. Uh, and um, Noah and I are now working on another book, Mushrooms of Cascadia. So we ended up doing a lot more photography. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a biodiversity educator with a particular emphasis on on fungi and a lot of photography experience under my belt, although certainly not as focused as Allison's. Um, so, um, Allison, do you want to take this or? Actually, this is yours, I think. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so one thing that um, I think Allison has uh, sort of stressed in bringing me on this year is that we're going to try and open the range of this uh, workshop to include people who are brand new to photography and really curious about what they can do with equipment that they already own without necessarily loading up on um, uh, all sorts of gear, although certainly there will be an opportunity to use more advanced forms of gear. But really the point of this will be to get you to take photographs that you like, um, whether or not those remain with you um, and you are the only person who ever really engages with them for your own enjoyment, that is, or whether or not you've got some sort of utilitarian purpose or, or broader audience in mind when you're generating these images. Um, so we, we do wanna sort of let people know that whether or not you're coming at this from a sort of more aesthetic fine art side, um, more of a documentarian scientific side, which is a lot of what I've done, um, or somewhere in between, um, there will be something in this workshop um, for you. Um, we will have a lot of time um, to be able to sort of address your particular goals and teach you the skills that address those goals specifically. Um, this last point here may not be self-explanatory, but I, I want to stress my own story, my own journey with photography here is that um, I used to carry a camera with me 24-7 um, and I was taking photos of virtually every single mushroom I saw and had a tripod over my shoulder at all times. And then I put that big heavy rig down for five years and I switched tactics and started using a much smaller camera and really even just my phone and a hand lens. Um, and, and then I went back to carrying my big DSLR camera and my big tripod and making nicer images again. And I guess the, the point that I wanna communicate here is that we want to um, talk about our stories during the course of this class in such a way that you feel uh, uh, that it's easy and not only um, easy, but totally acceptable to sort of shrink and swell your engagement with sort of the different levels of uh, involvement and sort of um, 
heavy duty photography versus sort of more light, um, flexible photography while you're in the field. And we'll just show you how to sort of switch easily, switch gears easily between those two approaches. Okay. All right, this is mine. Um, so the class is Monday to Friday, though we uh, uh, ask you to come on Sunday and we'll do a little intro on Sunday evening. But each day of the class is the same. We share all of our meals together in the dining hall. The food is astonishing at this facility. When somebody invited me to do the class here, she told me it was gourmet food. I didn't quite believe her, but I am a foodie and the food is incredible. <laughs> So looking forward to that again. Okay, so apart from the food, we are actually teaching something. Um, every morning we'll have presentations in the morning in the classroom, and uh, we're going to show you in a bit the schedule, so a broad variety of presentations, lots and lots and lots to learn. It, and every afternoon we're shooting in the field. So in the field, um, Chris and I will be walking around. We are not there to, to make our own pictures. We might shoot later in the week, depending how well people are doing, but mostly we are walking around from person to person and helping you compose your shots, helping you with any technical questions on your camera, helping you find mushrooms and mix those. Um, and then in the evening, if you're not too tired after dinner, Christian and I are available in the evening and we'll give, we have some talks that we can give if there's interest. We can also do one-on-one -on -one instruction. We can do some helping with people edit their photos, pretty much whatever you want in the evenings, we're there to uh, meet your needs. So there's a lot of opportunity for one-on-one -on -one learning here, whether you're a, you've just gotten your camera or whether you're a whiz with your camera. Um, as I said, there's individual guidance in the field. We walk around and we help you with whatever questions you might have. Um, uh, optional instruction in the evening. And in general, Christian will talk, uh, work with the beginner students, uh, will both work with the intermediate students, and I'll probably work with uh, more advanced students who want to do more advanced techniques and processing. Yeah, so now we're just going to go through what the schedule for the week looks like. Um, Monday is sort of opening. Um, we'll introduce ourselves to the whole group and we'll uh, actually ask you to introduce yourselves because that will help give us a picture of what your um, skill level is, what your background is, and what your goals are. Um, we will talk about the very, very basics of photography just to make sure that we're all on the same footing in terms of knowing where we are with uh, uh, the, the basic mechanics of optics. Um, we'll talk a little bit about phone photography since we assume that at least everyone will share that same piece of gear. Um, and Allison and I think we'll both be stressing how useful um, a phone is even for the more advanced students to at least do some sort of like planning and visualizing. So um, I think the point that we're communicating there is that phone photography has a place in everyone's repertoire, even if you do end up creating much fancier images at the end of it. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the specific nuances of preparing the scene when we're, uh, focused on extremely tiny organisms or at least middling sized organisms, not as uh, easy necessarily to prepare the scene as with um, a wildflower, but equally as critical, if not more so. And then we will um, go through sort of a step-by-step -step, um, uh, outline of what it's like to take a photo in the field from start to finish, finding the organism, um, searching for an organism, uh, if you have a target in mind, all the way through to creating the image and then processing it and putting it out into the world, if that's what your end goal is. Yeah, a little uh, additional something about the introductions. First thing Monday morning, Christian said, we'll ask you all to introduce yourselves. But we are also going to be sending out a questionnaire in advance of the class to all of the students. And we ask on that questionnaire your experience levels, both in taking photos and finding mushrooms and mixos in processing. We ask you what you want out of the class. And the goal of that questionnaire is to find all that information and also so that we can then tailor the class to your needs ahead of time. Yeah, so that's... Please, if you do <laughs> register, please fill out that questionnaire. The more information you give us, the more that we can tailor the class to your needs. Yeah, that's a really, really uh, crucial point is that um, there is still time for us to adapt to what it is that you want and prepare for what you want. So please don't just overlook that questionnaire. Um, yeah. This is not the survey at the end of the bank transaction where they say, how did I do? This is actually content that we're asking you to help us provide you. Um, Allison, you want to take Tuesday? 
Sure. Okay. So Tuesday, we're going to start the day by uh, talking about how to find mushrooms and mixos. And when we go to the field that first day, before we even take out cameras, we're just going to walk around and show you what we're looking for. Um, to find now, some mushrooms are pretty obvious, but a lot of them aren't. So we're going to show you what we're looking for, how we find them. Um, and then uh, uh, in the classroom again on Tuesday morning, Christian's going to do a talk on just the basics of mushroom identification. Some of you may know that, some of you may not. Um, I'll talk about the basics of slime mold identification. I suspect that more people will know about mushrooms than slime molds. Um, I think I'll probably do a present the presentation on gear. So obviously you have the, you have the gear that you have, but this is more if you ever want to get more gear, what's useful, what's not, what to look for when you're getting gear, specific things. Uh, Christian, I think, will do a, a bit of a presentation on wide angle macro, wide angle macro, and then we'll both show you what's in our bags, which is widely different, as Christian suggested. He's gone to a, a sort of middle level of not, not a lot of gear, and I tend to have a lot of gear and a lot of accessories. And it's great that there are these differences between Christian and me in many respects, so you can see the extremes here, but it's kind of fun to show you what's in our bags. Then on Wednesday morning, I'm going to talk about a technique called focus stacking, which is something that I use for all of my photos that I post. Um, focus stacking is basically a technique that allows you to get really good detailed photos of subjects and the smaller the subject is the more that you need to get focus stacking because you can't see the entire mushroom or slime mold in one photo with high magnification um, so there's a lot about focus stacking i'll talk, talk about what it is how to do it how to run the software how to set up your camera all those things it's uh the other thing about focus stacking is you can use um okay camera settings such that the background is soft and blurry as opposed to getting a lot of depth in the background. And as you'll see when I show some photos, my particular style of photos is more, what I would say, more artistic. The goal in my photography is to show the beauty of mushrooms and slime molds to let uh, to hopefully draw people into the woods to go look for themselves. And for me, that means clean photos clean and clean, soft backgrounds. So I'll show you how I do that. Um, I use Lightroom and Photoshop, which are both ex excellent photo editing tools. Some people love editing. Some people hate editing. I think that the reason that some people hate it is because they just don't know some of the particular trick tips and techniques you can use to actually make the process go really quickly. I happen to love it. It took me a while to learn it, but I will teach you all of the tricks and tips that I've known to make it a lot easier to edit your photos. Um, I also like Lightroom because it, behind the um, the photo processing is a database engine, basically. So I have tens of thousands, actually hundreds of thousands of photos in my Lightroom database. And I can find any photo I've ever taken in a matter of seconds because of the way that that database is set up. So I'll also show you most of my editing I do in Lightroom. Some of the post-processing I do in Photoshop. I'll show you some examples in a bit. And I will uh, share with you the Photoshop to some people is really intimidating with good reason. It's very, very complicated, but I will show you in one of the presentations all of the basics that you need to know for Photoshop and three or four particular sets of things I do in Photoshop so that you don't have to know the entire package, just particular techniques to get uh, the soft backgrounds that I do or to remove unnecessary things like dirt from your mushroom. So in both Lightroom and Photoshop, I'll show you some step-by-step -step editing examples. And one of the things I say in those two presentations is it's a lot to absorb, but all you really need to know is what can be done, not how to do it, because I will also give you a list of websites and uh, instructors in particular, where there's wonderful, completely free, great videos online to show you how to do things. And so all you need to know is what can be done. And then you can go look at the videos online and find out or remind yourself how to do it. Then on Thursday morning, I will talk a bit more about macro and what I call extreme macro photography for um, more for slime molds than for mushrooms. And this tends to be what I do in my home studio. 
uh, table, not studio, my little table here, um, it, rather than in the field. It's a lot of gear to carry in the field, and I'm a small person, so I tend to do it at home. Um, and the most extreme here is I actually take microscope objectives. I have 5X, 10X, and 20X microscope objectives that I adapt to my camera so that I can take highly detailed photographs of tiny things, mostly slime molds at home. And you can really see their beauty. And then the rest um, of the day, I think, is Christian. Yeah, and I'll pick up after Allison sort of finishes with that um, extreme macro technique. And then we'll sort of zoom all the way back out, right, to the beginning of what photography even is. It's sort of um, historical use in terms of bringing uh, organisms that are out in the world into a sort of concrete form that we can share with each other and compare more easily and how that's revolutionized, how we um, classify organisms, um, how much it's advanced our ability to identify them, but also how much the philosophy of taking photos informs the actual choices that we make during the process of taking the photo. Um, it might seem abstract, but actually I'm going to give you some uh, cases or examples where uh, a particular goal or a, a philosophical orientation changes what you do and how you prepare the scene, how you edit the photo, or how you light the organism, for example. Um, I will also talk about some of the um, context that drives me to take certain pictures versus others. So if I have uh, the goal to show an ecological connection in mind, I will take a different photo than if I'm simply trying to do a portrait of the organism itself. Um, so a lot of what guides um, work in the field comes on the front end where you're sitting in your bed at night thinking, what photo would I like to take tomorrow and why would I like to take it? Um, who has asked me for a photo? What am I trying to illustrate? And then we will talk a little bit about what those media products end up looking like. Obviously, I have a couple um, book publications, um, but I've also been published in magazines. Both Allison and I have um, social media accounts that we tend to put a lot of our photos on, and they're all slightly different in terms of the considerations that they require from us, um, both on the front end as well as in dealing with them once they're out into the world. Um, I will talk a little bit about the more creative things that people are doing with their photos these days. Um, the ability to make composite images, um, focus stacking is one example that Allison already talked about, but um, there's actually other ways of stitching photos together that aren't so much in a stack as in parallel that allow you to do even more things um, than were traditionally possible due to the limitations of print media versus digital media. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And I'm actually quite excited about uh, what people have started to do in that regard. Um, that connects to what we'll be talking about on Friday morning, which is sort of best practices for getting your digital files ready for web publication. Um, not real complicated, but there are sort of a, a bullet pointed checklist of things you need to think about if you're going to be preparing your photos for um, digital outlets versus print outlets. They are different. And then we'll talk about a little bit about printing as well. Um, for example, if you're going to do fine art prints, um, posters, anything like that. And then um, you will probably see me and Allison using iNaturalist or hear us referencing iNaturalist. Um, and we will do a little bit about uh, that platform. It's a community science platform where all of my photos go virtually and many of Allison's photos end up there as well. Um, but we'll talk about uh, the sort of virtues of using iNaturalist as a way of um, bringing the organisms that you take photos of out to the sort of um, more scientifically minded or academically minded community of people who might be interested in using them. And then last, uh, we'll do um, a show and tell session, which is basically a time for you as the students to show off what you did during the week, um, what successes you had, what challenges you faced. Um, and I'm honestly looking forward to reviewing your photos and giving feedback almost more than any other part of this, because I love hearing um, what people find themselves oriented towards to after having a few days to practice it and, and change their approach. And then lastly, every single day this week, um, as Allison mentioned, there will be opportunities for you to get us one-on-one. -on -one. So you can pull us aside and really uh, ask us specific questions, get in the weeds with us. If there is something that you are just butting your head against over and over and not getting it right, um, there will be time for you to help us or ask us to help you solve it. Um, I am very much looking forward to these evening critique sessions for those of you who choose to take advantage of it because 
Noah and I um, really improved each other's photography dramatically by having lots of back and forth sessions about what worked and what didn't about photos that we were going to use in our books. And it, it really advanced both of our skill levels pretty rapidly. Um, you get way better, way faster if you have someone to bounce your ideas off of. And then, uh, as Allison mentioned, if we have extra time, once we're done with all the one-on-ones, um, we both have presentations that we give to the general public about a lot of different topics relating to mushrooms and slime molds. And I would love to be able to, to present a few of those over the course of the week. Um, like I said, um, this philosophical sort of part of the class won't take up too much time, but I wanna make sure that everyone does have a footing in um, the kinds of things that I think about when I see other people's images on the web. Um, Allison asked me yesterday when we were um, going through this, what I meant by the inherent dangers of images. And something that I sort of want to stress over the course of, of this class is that uh, images have larger audiences in 2024 than ever in human history. More people will see an image that you create, or at least have the potential to see an image that you create now than any other image um, creating created in human history. Just the way that we sort of communicate is at a scale and at a speed um, that sometimes means that you unintentionally put something out into the world that shapes how people perceive an organism or an ecology for a long time thereafter. So I don't, I don't uh, wanna overstress it, but there is sort of a sense of responsibility that I think um, it's worth mulling over as a group while we're in, in the, um, in the week that we do this class. Um, okay, so I'm actually just gonna move on here so that Allison can talk about the field settings. So Matt, Matt Lines, a beautiful island. Um, Andy, help me with this. Is it maybe three or four miles long and maybe a mile wide? Is that about right? Um, Maddie would know more. She actually lives on the island. Uh, Maddie, what's the exact? 13 miles long by three miles. 13. Oh, okay. That's bigger than I thought. Um, it is a beautiful island. There are lots of forests on there, lots of preserves, so lots of protected space, which is where we take you. I've shown some examples in here. So I've been there, I was there last year, and I uh, hiked a lot of the trails and looked for the, the diversity hot spots, but Everything changes from year to year in the mushroom and slime mold world, depending on the weather and other factors. So Christian and I will be flying out several days in advance, and we'll spend uh, uh, two full days, maybe a little bit more than that, exploring all around the island to find what we think are the best places for diversity and to take the group. Um, the woods are fairly open, so it's easy to take a group and have everybody have their own spot. On the top right is a fellow from the class last year in his little spot in the mossy logs. There are a lot of dead mossy logs on the ground, which are ideal habitats for mushrooms and mixos. Uh, there's a big state park on the island called Big Bay State Park, which is probably where we'll spend three, three of the five days in various locations in the park. Um, the only photo I took of Big Bay State Park is in the bottom left. It has a beautiful seashore but uh, it also has gorgeous woods. All the woods on the island are uh, mixed woodlands. There's some pine trees. There's a lot of different kinds of hardwoods. Absolutely perfect habitat. It is a, a really good area for biodiversity, northern Wisconsin. Um, I actually went to grad school in Wisconsin and I lived there for six years. And one thing I hated there was the mosquitoes. So I was a little nervous about that, but there were not mosquitoes, much to my delight. Uh, it's a little bit of the, it's in the middle of Lake Superior, so there's a little bit of a wind effect, which is not too windy at all for photography, but enough to get rid of the mosquitoes, so that was a real delight. The That's woods incredible, are, I hadn't heard that, that's really lucky. <laughs> yeah, the woods, the woods are gorgeous there, at, and we're going at absolutely a, a fantastic time of year, it's just about the peak of the mushroom season, so many different trails, but Christian and I will scout them all out ahead of time. And I'm just, yeah, noticing the composition of the woods in these photos, those birch trees are very exciting to me because they're incredible mushroom trees and I don't get to engage with them uh, in California. And I'm really hoping um, that one of the nights I'll be able to give my talk about bioregions of mushrooms in the United States, because this will be a bioregion that I've actually never spent time in. Um, and it is, as, as uh, Allison just mentioned, a really good place for mushroom biodiversity. And I'm excited to see 
um, what it's like there. It definitely fills in a gap in my knowledge about fungi in North America. Um, so we're now briefly just going to talk about what gear Allison and I use, not in any detail really, but just so that you get a sense of um, the kinds of photographers that we are, so that you will know um, sort of basically that you will have a range all the way from me walking around in the woods with nothing but a phone and a hand lens. So basically, you know, my pockets, just the pockets on my jeans, I can spend, you know, a week in the field with just those two pieces of equipment. Or if I want a little bit more versatility in terms of getting photos of really small organisms, I will take my TG6 camera, which is an Olympus. It's about the same size as my cell phone, a little bit thicker, um, but it certainly fits in the pocket of my pants. Um, I, it's a very lightweight rig to take with me. That said, um, if I'm looking to take photos that are for eventual print publication, or if I'm really looking to make uh, beautiful portraits, I will take my Nikon single lens reflex camera and then a couple different lenses that are not um, really extreme in any way. Um, they are sort of basic lenses, but the way that I use them um, is sort of uh, tailored towards taking macro photos. I do use a tripod anytime I'm using my bigger camera, um, but this is really all the gear I ever really use. Uh, I will talk a little bit about different lighting gear, a basic flash, uh, a very small one. Um, and then uh, the gear that I use in terms of processing is Photoshop, certainly, um, but Instagram. And I, I know that a lot of people share their photography through Instagram as the primary social media platform for images. And I do want to talk um, about the different sort of uh, editing that is built into Instagram and how you can use that. It's actually very powerful and very quick and convenient um, to do if you learn a few of the basic uh, tips and tricks. Um, so I will I will spend some time talking about that specifically. Um, but now Allison's going to talk about her gear. I'm a bit on the other extreme. I tend to carry around a fair bit of gear into the woods. Um, my goal with my photography, as I said earlier, is to make artistic photos, to draw people into this world. My favorite comment on social media is when somebody says, I never knew these things existed. I'm going to go look for them. Absolute favorite comment. Um, my uh, camera setup has changed quite a bit over the years, maybe two or three different cameras. I have one setup for the field, which is what I'll show you here, and a completely different setup I use at home, which I'll talk about in the class. But in the field, I now use an Olympus EM1 Mark III camera, which is now probably four years old. Uh, camera technology changes quite rapidly, but this camera is still terrific for what I do. I first used an Olympus 60 millimeter macro lens, but last year I switched to a new lens they brought out, a 90 millimeter 2X macro lens. Now, it is capable of taking photographs of very small subjects, but you can use the same macro lens. If you just pull back, you can also take a photograph of much larger subjects. So it, just because the name says macro, you're not limited to very small subjects. If I really want to get tinier subjects like slime moles, I use the Olympus 2X teleconverter. So that makes the camera a 4X macro lens, which means it's four times life size, which means it's four times um, smaller subject that you can get that will fill your, uh, your view. I was doing landscape photography for a while and I had a Manfrotto tripod, which was big and heavy and solid, which is what you need for landscape photography, but it was too dang heavy. So a year and a half or so ago, I bought this slick tripod, which is much, much lighter and tucks into my waist belt. So I'm hands-free, which is great. And a small tripod. So it's a much smaller package and I'm low to the ground. Most of the time, the center post on that tripod, tripod can be removed. I don't even know where it is anymore. I never use it. <laughs> um, so I get my camera very low to the ground and I'll show you a trick that even though the camera's elevated on top of the tripod on, and during class, I'll show you a trick to get your camera completely down to the ground. Almost all of my photography in the field is done with natural light. I really prefer natural light. Uh, it may mean I use long shutter speeds, but who cares because I'm on a tripod, so I'm not touching it. Uh, if I do need to get a little bit of additional light or what we call fill light, I will use a couple of these Ulanzi LED light panels. They're very inexpensive. They're good. They have nice diffusion. They have a nice light. So 
uh, the few times I need fill light, I use that. I do a fair bit of processing. I, I enjoy the process on the computer. I really love how a five or 10 or 15 minutes uh, editing in a photo can make a dramatic difference. And I'll show you that in a little bit. So some people, as I said, really don't like that process. I do, but I'm hoping that I will, uh, in showing you some tricks and some methods that I use, it will make it a lot easier for you to edit your photos if you choose to go down that path. There's no right or wrong answer here. It's a question of personal preferences and style. So I use Lightroom for my image organization. As I said, there's a database in there. And I do most of my edits in Lightroom, but for some of the trickier edits, um, which I'll show you in a bit, I, I pull the photos into Photoshop and I edit them in there, and then they go right back into Lightroom. And then occasionally I use a software called Topaz AI, AI meaning, of course, artificial intelligence. And they have some, if, if I, for whatever reason, the photo is noisy, they have some denoise editing, uh, but they also have sharpening, which can be miraculous at times um, to really sharpen a photo. I'm a pixel peeper, so I like sharp photos. Allison, uh, we have yeah. a question from one of um, one of our participants on this webinar, uh, and they're asking, does focus bracketing still work with the teleconverter? Yes. Okay. And does the teleconverter work on the 60 millimeter macro lens? No. But um, there are other things that you can get that if you want to, for, for a long time, I got very high magnification photography with a 60 millimeter lens. I will tell you two ways you can do that. One is to get something called a Raynox, R-A-Y-N-O-X, Raynox 250, which is essentially a 2X, a little bit more than 2X teleconverter. It's inexpensive, maybe 80 or $90, and uh, gives you twice the magnification, and it's great. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other thing you can get is extension tubes, and I'll talk about all those in the class. But between the extension tubes and the teleconverter, you can actually get to 4x, which is the same 4x I'm getting here. Okay. Well, thank you for that answer. And I think that's that. I'm, I'm done with this one, Christian. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Next up here, um, Alison and I are both going to do a little bit of a gallery, showing you some of the photos that we've taken. Um, and to talk through a little bit about each one. Um, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on any of these, but I do wanna stress something that I don't think I actually really mentioned. Um, Allison talked about what her goal is in terms of creating an image that stimulates someone's desire to go into the field and meet the organisms that Allison is making these beautiful portraits of. And although I do a similar thing, oftentimes um, I am taking a photo to try and uh, stimulate a question about how that organism relates to its environment or to other organisms that live around it, um, or to help sort of paint a picture of how to recognize that organism. So I'm usually thinking about putting together a presentation or some sort of print document uh, that is educational, maybe for a class. So oftentimes I've got a bit more of a story in mind when I go to take a photo rather than a, a portrait um, that I'm looking to take. That said, I do both. So um, something that I want you to keep in mind in all of the images I'm about to show you is that I have criticisms of every single one of my own photos. None of these are perfect in my opinion. And we will definitely go into what I uh, consider to still be technically wrong or still be something that I can improve upon all of these images um, in the class. We'll talk more about where I would, where I would make improvements. Um, but one way of just showing you that is these sort of before and afters. Here's a photo of a, a beautiful pinkish polypore called the ice cream sherbet polypore. Um, because it's got these sort of like um, pastel pinkish to white tones. And it actually has a texture that's kind of like ice cream. It's very soft and spongy and damp. Um, and this is the first photo I took of it sort of straight out of the camera. And I thought, oh, that's pretty good. It's well lit. But then I took one more photo, and I think it was by sheer luck that my flash died. The batteries ran out, and I suddenly got a totally different appearance out of the image. And I realized that although this one is perhaps more well lit, there's actually a downside or a cost to having um, that much um, additional light on the pores. They flatten the depth, um, uh, the sort of dimensionality of this fruit body. 
And so sometimes you learn by accident that there's actually another way of getting what you want or another sort of way of framing the image that you're looking for. Um, sometimes what you think might be uh, desirable actually works against uh, sort of a more dramatic or more illustrative image. Um, here's an example of a slime mold photo that I've taken. I don't actually photograph too many slime molds, um, but you know I have to hold my own if I'm teaching a class with Allison. And this is sort of an example of just a compositional decision. Um, I could have lined my photo up so that this was a, a straight line across the across the screen, but I decided to angle my tripod a little bit so that there was sort of a diagonal march of this little troop of um, slime molds from the bottom left corner up to the top right corner, and they sort of more pleasingly fill the frame. Um, the very center of the image is in focus, but both the foreground and the background are blurry, and that adds a lot to the sense of dimension, even though we're talking about a scale on the order of, you know, centimeters here. Um, but that's just a way of, of doing some sort of in-between pure portraiture and, and sort of in situ sort of communicating what the organism looks like in the field. Here's an image of um, some mushrooms. So this is very close to sort of uh, the standard kind of images that I take. This one is a little bit more on the portrait end because the subject is so naturally beautiful. These are very perfect fruit bodies that were covered in these little droplets of um, actually exudate. So this is um, a substance that's produced by the mushroom itself. It's not just dew landing on it from the environment. Um, and that was the goal that I was trying to um, sort of hone in on with this image is to show that this mushroom actually does produce these milky droplets on the gill edges. And that influenced my decision to have them all in the same orientation. These were growing on the sort of underside of a log, so I had to roll the log a little bit. Um, and I had to really decide at what angle I was going to engage the fruit bodies with the sort of lens of my camera. And we'll talk a lot about choosing that critical angle um, all the way from straight down on top of the mushrooms, which is unfortunately what a lot of beginners orient towards, myself included when I was brand new to this, um, all the way to the opposite end, sort of the bug's eye view, um, where you're looking uh, straight up into the gills of a mushroom <laughs> and sort of the various in-between postures that you can choose to take and, and what you lose and what you gain at sort of every angle of declination on the way. Um, here's another one that, uh, highlight some exudate. Um, so these droplets of sort of me metabolic liquid um, being released by a very young mushroom. But um, something that I want to sort of communicate is, is that this is not really a diagnostic photo in any way. I was adding this photo to the, to the slideshow and I realized I couldn't even tell what it was. I didn't know how to label it because I had really not included it enough um, to identify it. But that is not why I took this photo. This photo really is closer to a pure portrait. Um, and there's some lighting decisions that I made about it um, to sort of serve that purpose. <clears throat> Here's another one that uh, has a lot to do with sort of the angle uh, of, of orientation of the lens towards the fruit bodies themselves. And there's some major um, sort of decisions about this that I would do differently if I were to take this photo again. But this is sort of right at the beginning of my um, attempts to take portraiture of fungi. And I did manage to at least capture some details in this one that are diagnostically useful. Um, that little white fringe of triangular teeth around the edge of these caps may look very normal to you or very sort of uh, unassuming, um, but it is actually quite atypical. Not many mushrooms show this little feature and almost by itself, highlighting this feature is good enough to allow you to identify this to a species. Um, and that's sort of why I want to include that section on mushroom identification on Tuesday morning is so that you can become aware of the sort of morphological features that become the focal points of certain kinds of photographs. You don't, we're not going to try and teach you to identify every single mushroom you see, but um, like Allison said, knowing the space of what is possible um, is more important than knowing how to do it uh, or, or teaching you how to do it every time. You need to know the sorts of uh, features that be that are important from a taxonomic perspective so that you can choose to highlight them when you see them. Um, so, so that's why we're going to do a, at least an introductory sort of glance at, at mushroom morphology and, and identification practices. Um, here's another slime mold photo I've taken, one of the relatively few, but this is one of my favorites that I've ever taken because it is like five or six different layers of depth 
Um, and because of how the lighting uh, ended up cooperating, I was able to sort of show this slime mold re retreating into the background into the deep dark recesses of this rotting log. Um, and we will uh, talk a lot about preparing the scene. I definitely had to do a lot of that for this image, getting it ready for the photo to even be taken. So Allison and I, I'm sure we'll both be spending a lot of time on how much work goes into a photo before you ever press the shutter. Um, and with that, um, I'm gonna sort of end on this one. This is a little purple coral mushroom um, that uh, looks like it was relatively natural, but there was actually quite a bit of changes that I made to this these fruit bodies before I took this photo. Um, these were actually growing in widely divergent places and I sort of brought them together for the purpose of the image. And that is a decision that is sometimes uncomfortable to make for people who are accustomed to sort of uh, non-interference photography with like wildflowers or animals, for example. But with fungi, it's a lot more common and we'll talk about how to make it look as natural as possible while still maintaining um, the goal in mind of, of taking whatever whatever that goal is for you, whether it's a beautiful image or a documentary image. And this particular one, I'll go back for a minute, yeah. was one I had never seen and I was really excited to see for the first time on Madeline Island last year. Oh, yes. So actually, you probably saw, so Madeline Island is the North American relative. This one is from New Zealand, which you're hopefully oh. going to see with me next month. Um, so yes, this is a relative of one that we're likely to see in Madeline Island called Claveria zollingeri, which yeah. is beautiful amethyst purple coral. Actually, the one in Madeline Island is even richer colored than the one in New Zealand. So it, it's a very pretty species. Um, this is not a wide angle shot, or sorry, it is a wide angle shot, but it's not a macro shot. Um, but I will be talking about using a specialized lens that allows you to get a very wide field of view and tell sort of a story of mushrooms in habitat. Um, this is obviously a species that's familiar to a lot of people. This is Amanita muscaria. I'm sure we will see it or one of its relatives at Madeline Island. Um, but the story that's being told in this particular image is if you recognize those leaves um, growing on the little saplings in between these fruit bodies, some you realize that something very strange is afoot because these are uh, not um, North American plants. These are also in New Zealand. This is an invasive um, sort of setting for Amanita muscaria. It's from North America. It was introduced to New Zealand. And those shrubby, shrubby plants in the middle there are New Zealand native plants. So there is actually a story to be told with this image. And using the wide angle lens allowed me to sort of get that data all in one place um, so that I could use this image in presentations I give about invasive fungi. Um, just a few more shots. Um, I will be showing you how to take some of, so this is the opposite of focus stacking. This is focus uh, stitching. So these are images that are composites. I've took one, two, three, four landscape images in a row horizontally and then stitched them end to end like a puzzle. And that allows you to um, not just use a wide angle lens to get landscapes, but to use actually the exact same lens that I use for up close photos of slime molds and fungi and um, basically treat it as if it was a wide angle lens. So I don't have to have more gear. I don't have to buy more equipment. I can just use uh, a slightly different editing process to get, in my opinion, even better landscapes. And that allows me to often sort of paint these um, backdrops uh, for the portraits that I take, um, like this sort of beautiful entoloma that grows around the shores of this particular lake in New Zealand. Hopefully Alison and I will see this next month. Um, but I like doing these sort of um, mushroom in habitat uh, context photos. They they really paint a a, a deeper picture of, of where these mushrooms grow. And um, it can be sort of isolating to look at a photo of fruit bodies with just a little bit of moss in the background because that moss could be anywhere. Um, taking these sort of zoomed out habitat shots helps um, me get a better sense of what fungi are. Okay, so now I'm going to hand it off to Allison and she's going to talk about some of her photos. Okay, thank you, Christian. I am going to start with some photos of uh, mushrooms that you can find on Madeline Island. This first one here is Zoramphalina, and uh, it's a good example of showing how I have a soft, blurry background. What I typically do is, um, well, if I, I, mushrooms are often on twigs and sticks on the ground so I can move them, or these were on a log, so I put somewhat behind the mushroom a leaf or some moss. Um, I want my backgrounds to have as little distraction as possible. Distraction is a key word for me. 
uh, I saw because I said I want I want people to see the beauty of the mushroom or the slime mold. The next one, Christian. Yep, Christian, are you there? Yeah. Um, this is also on Mad Madeline Island. It is Placataropsis. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Crispa. It's a beautiful mushroom. It looks a little bit like Schizophyllum commune, which is a, a guild, another guild mushroom. It's pretty nondescript on top, but if you look at the gills underneath, the patterns are really, really pretty. And here, for again, to create the soft background, I, I actually have these little holding, a little holding device that's used for soldering that I carry in my bag. And so I use that little device to hold the twig up and I put a bit, of, a bit of a distance and put some moss in the background. And the next one is a uh, folio to species. I'm not sure if it's, you know what, it, Christians, with the SQs. Christian, you're on mute. Squarosa or Squarosoides? Yeah, I wasn't sure which one. Yeah, it's one of those. Uh, we found this on the north end of Madeline Island last year. They're really, really pretty little mushrooms. This is a uh, um, the same gear that I showed you before, these are not small by any stretch. These are pretty normal sized mushrooms, but I just hold back with my macro lens and I can take mushrooms photographs of any size. And normally I put the mosses behind so they're soft and blurry, but in this case I didn't, it was a very big log and it would, I didn't, I wasn't able to put something behind enough to get a blur. So I just put the moss directly behind just to block uh, some not very pretty stuff that was behind it. So the class is titled Mushrooms, Mixos, and More. So this is an example, I have a couple examples here of the more part. Um, there's obviously a lot that one can photograph in the woods and the two things combined here. When I was looking in one area for mushrooms or mixers, I saw this, uh, what I first couldn't quite get. And then I, I thought, actually at first I thought it was a slime mold, but then I looked closely and knew that it clearly wasn't. And I realized it was a seed pod. Um, it's a seed pod of a, they're really, really pretty. It's, I think the plant is called Canada Mayflower. And uh, again, I isolated it by just clearing out the background and putting a leaf enough of a distance and angling my camera so that I'm avoiding all the other distracting things in the background. And the only thing in the background is that leaf. And I also got a little spider. If you look closely underneath the right, uh, the, on the right seed pod right underneath, there's a little, what I think is a spider under there. That's amazing. I've been looking at this photo as part of the slideshow for a week and I did not <laughs> notice the spider. <laughs> Actually, it's pretty funny because when I was looking at the at the thing uh, last night, just to remind myself of what we'd done, I, I'd, I'd forgotten about it. I noticed it then. So uh, the next photo is another seed pod. Um, this one is from a, the, it's a northern star flower. I had seen something like this in Alaska once before, and so I recognized it again when I saw it. The seed pod is just gorgeous. I also did a really extreme shot of the seed pod, which I didn't show here, but it looks like a soccer ball or even the compound eye of an insect. And again, I am isolating the subject by putting something in the background and making it blurry. So the viewer's attention is drawn simply to the subject and nothing is distracting. And something I just want to add about that, when I look at Allison's, you know, ultra macro or even just, you know, high macro images, um, they often become so stunningly abstract that I think, well, that's not how I experience the organism. And then I remember that I'm not the only organism that experiences these. From the perspective of a springtail or a little tiny nematode, they are experiencing these textures mm -hmm. that are microscopic to us in a very visceral way. And it may be the case that their mouth parts or their legs are actually adapted to sort of um, engage with these textures and they're important. They're ecologically and evolutionarily important. So it's not just art. It can actually show you features or details um, that are important to consider if you want to understand what the lives of these organisms are really like. Um, they're, they're shaped that way for a reason and Allison's showing us those shapes. Next one, Christian. Oh, speaking, of uh, well, speaking of organisms <laughs> and speaking of springtails, springtails are these um, tiny little cartoonish um, uh, bugs and I, they're adorable. They come in a huge variety of colors. My favorite is pure white with blue eyes. Um, I take specimens home from the woods a lot and look at them under my microscope and I see springtails a lot in my microscope. 
Uh, this is not in the microscope. This is not at home. This is in the field on Madeline Island. So this is a slime mold called Metatrichia vesperia that is not in the Western United States. I'd never seen it before and I was dying to see it. And I was thrilled to see it on Madeline Island several times. The, I think this is the last day I found the best bunch. And I chose to isolate these two clusters of fruiting bodies. And the springtail was not there when I first was setting up my camera. And then he got into the scene. They are called springtails because they spring with their tails. They move very quickly, but I got lucky enough. I waited actually um, a while for him to or her to stay still for a while. And I could actually do a stack of photos. Um, this is a lot of fun. That springtail is maybe a millimeter and a half and long, and those slime molds are about three millimeters tall, but it's actually pretty easy to get photos like that with macro lenses. One of my favorite uh, families of fungi are bird's nest, uh, they so-called because they look like uh, a bird's nest with eggs in them. Those eggs are called periodols. Is that right, Kristen? Did I pronounce it correctly? And they're periodols, yeah. yeah. And I, Long, long, long time ago, I remember seeing a close-up photo of one of those pretty and I wanted to do that, and I finally got an opportunity to do that in Mendocino this summer. So I found a lot of different uh, bird's nest, and then I found this one that had the pretty intact. And so first I took this photo of the three of them, and then I uh, carefully, with tweezers I carry, removed the lower two and did a, a zoomed in to, to see the inside of the bird's nest and see more detail on the pertials. And so I finally got a shot that I'd been wanting to take for several years. And the next one, Christian. So now I'll give you a few examples of the kinds of edits I do in Lightroom and Photoshop. I think these are also Zerumphalina on a nice mossy log, and I had moss in the background as well. But when I got home and looked at the, the focus stack on the computer, what I didn't like was that the moss in the background, there's a bit of a pretty strong vertical line there that I found really distracting. So I took this photo into Photoshop, and in probably three minutes, I turned it into the next one, which really softens that blur. It took me, as I said, probably three to four minutes to do that. And Christian, if you flip back and forth, um, so to me, it's a, a it's a much more appealing photo when I have softened that background. This is one of the techniques that I will show you how to do in Photoshop. Um, it's really I use it a lot, and I it, to soften backgrounds if I haven't been able to do it in the field. As much as I love editing in Lightroom and Photoshop, I of course want to get as much as I can possibly get done in the field. I want to spend more time in the woods and less time at my computer. Uh, next photo is another example of editing. It's subtle. This is a Helvella species. And um, I was pretty happy with the photo, but there are some spots on the mushrooms and the lighting was a bit extreme. So with just a few quick edits, I changed that to that. And so I got rid of, there was a little bit of moss. If you go back and forth, Christian, there's a little bit of moss on the middle mushroom that I thought was distracting. So I got rid of that one. I removed a few dirt spots and I just lowered the lighting a little bit. And I really liked the other, the, the second photo a lot better. So that's probably five minutes between Lightroom and Photoshop. So once you learn what tricks to use, it's really quick if you choose to do this. So again, my goal is to make artistic photos to draw people to the beauty of mushrooms. Um, if you want to show mushrooms in situ exactly the way you find them, great. Just different styles and different things that people want. I think I have one more example of photo editing, a little bit more of an example. Uh, this is from Point Reyes National Seashore, which is near my home and is a really terrific uh, biodiversity hotspot. And these were in the duff and they were quite dirty. I carry uh, small paint brushes with me. Um, to clean dirt spots off mushrooms, not slime molds. If you do that with slime molds, you're likely going to destroy it. Um, but to brush spots off, and there was a lot of dirt on here. So I used various paintbrushes to, to get rid of the dirt, but I couldn't get it all off. And so at home, I went into Photoshop and I reduced, got rid of all the spots in Photoshop, as well as softening up the background because there were some lines on the, if you see that on the right side, there's sort of some white lines I hadn't noticed in the field. And um, so then, if Christian, if you flip the photo and show 
Here, I've gotten rid of all the dirt spots and I softened the background. And it makes a huge difference to me in the quality of the photo. I want people, again, to see the beauty of the mushroom. That took me maybe 15 minutes, in, mostly in Photoshop, to get rid of those dirt spots. So, Christian, if you just go back and forth a little bit, uh, you can decide for yourself which photo you prefer, you know, the in-situ showing the dirt or the cleaned up version. But again, just a matter of personal preference. And, you know, when I was talking to Allison about putting this together, um, like she said, there's it's a matter of personal preference. And I think I would have landed somewhere in between. I would have done probably 50% of the dirt um, because, and it, and it actually correlates with the mushroom itself. Some mushrooms are naturally sticky and they would look unrecognizable if they didn't have dirt on them. So learning the lives of the organism will actually help you make the decision about how much dirt to leave on or off. And in this case, these waxy caps are most often very, very clean. So removing more is probably makes sense to show what the, what the organism naturally looks like very often. These just happen to be slightly dirtier and Allison decided to make that, that decision. Thanks for that, Christian. Yep. Uh, next one. Okay, this is a more subtle example of, of cleaning up a photo. Again, for me, the key word is distraction. So I want people to be able to really be completely drawn to the subject and the beauty of this subject and not have anything distraction. And all those little, I think they're hyphy, uh, my seal or hair, so to speak, on the right side, I thought were a bit distracting. So I removed them very, very quickly. This took me probably three minutes in Photoshop. And again, if we flip back and forth, you can decide for yourself what you prefer, but I really prefer the, the second image without the distracting elements. I didn't do any further smoothing in the background because I'd already set up the scene well enough in the woods, and so I liked the soft background that I got. And I think uh, one more example here. So uh, as Christian said, we will talk a lot about preparing the scene, which for me means removing any distracting elements in the background. And as I said, I often put leaves in the background. So here I did put a dried leaf in the background, but I couldn't see it well enough in the small viewfinder in my camera. And what I didn't see is that the lines on the leaf are pretty clear to see here, and I find that distracting. So again, I used this technique I've developed in Photoshop to smooth out those backgrounds, which I'll show you how to do. And if we flip the picture, you'll see it's the same colors, but a much softer background. And it's, to me, it looks like a dramatically different picture. It's the same subject, but a different background. It has a completely different feeling. And in this photo with the softer background, then you're really drawn, you're, you're drawn attention to these beautiful little slime holes, They're like little like like soldiers climbing a mountain to me. And I actually noticed there's a, a springtail hiding in that little dark cave in the middle there. Oh, that's great! I never <laughs> noticed that. <laughs> See, this is Thank something you. I love. Is people often ask, you know, uh, what do you do with all the photos that you've kept for all those years? And I'm still discovering things about the organisms that I photographed, even after looking at them after 10 or 20 years. Um, there'll be features, if I'm going to write a description for a field guide, that I'll jog my memory by looking at a photo. And if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be able to interrogate it so finely. Yeah, actually, an interesting comment along those lines is, um, you know, I've learned more and more about photo editing and processing as well as taking photos. And sometimes I go back to photos from several years ago and I will re-edit them with what I've learned and it's a dramatically improved photograph. So it's fun to do that too. Yeah, and I assume that will be something that you talk about in terms of editing is keeping your originals sort of in a safe place so that you can make edited versions and always go back if you don't like how it ended up. Yeah, we'll talk about that, except if you do a lot of focus stacking, you can very quickly get terabytes of photos. So there are some choices to be made. I do... I don't save all of the back the the, the images for photo, focus stacks. Most of my focus stacks for me can be anywhere from five Im images to 500 images, depending on the magnification. So I don't save all of those. But for the photographs that I really like, I will save them. So I, I save a subset of my focus stacks. Uh, next one, I think I'll end. I think there's no more. Yeah, so I just... Uh, two or three photos uh, just to close out my part here. This is one of my favorites. It's a very common mushroom, a hemimycena, but this particular one had just gorgeous gill patterns. It's very almost dancer-like grace in it and the beautiful um, hairy feet, as I like to call them. I just thought it was a gorgeous mushroom. Again, my favorite subject in the background is to use moss. I put moss far enough away 
so that it was a blurry background and you're just seeing the grace and the beauty of the mushroom. And uh, this is a fun photo. This is from Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. I was looking for mushrooms and slime molds and a, in a crevice in a very large downed tree, I saw this spider in what I thought he was doing was guarding these uh, Arceria slime molds. Now the spider was very much alive, not dead, and very much alive and very much moving. So I actually did, gosh, probably 12 or 13 different focus stacks of the spider and combined the various parts of focus stacks to finally get the whole, an image with all of the spider's legs in focus. I probably spent, um, I'm embarrassed to say, about 40 hours on this photo, but I'm really happy with the result. It's just kind of a fun combination of two completely different things in nature. That's Chris, a gorgeous photo, Allison. I just wish you had given us a little bit of a warning before you had put it up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not going to put this on the uh, Golden Gate Park brochure they hand out to tourists, but yeah. I would go. I would go. Um, it's actually a pretty small spider. Okay, um, thank you. This is another one of my favorite photos. There's just a few more at the end. Not in the, we're not talking about processing anymore. I call this one the lemmings to the sea. It just really likes this lineup of these um, slime molds on an old rotted piece of wood. And the other thing I would love about this one was again, the background. So I want the background to be soft and blurry and I don't want it to be monotone. Um, every once in a while I put a leaf in the background that's just too monotone and I find that boring or me, even if the subject is in sharp focus. So I'm always looking for leaves that have, or something that has some variation in the color to make a more interesting background. That's now, if I had to do this one all over again, on the right side, there's a little bit too much of a blurry, a, a sharp edge on the top there. I probably would blur that out a little bit more. This, this photo I did probably four years ago and I would edit it differently now. I'm also, as Christian said earlier, I'm also extremely picky. And um, I critique my photos a lot. And I think I have maybe one more. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Just one. Th this is an example of a photo of what I call extreme macro. So this is done at home with, I have a Sony camera at home and I used a 10x microscope objective to uh, create this photo. This is a, a slime mold called Physerum leucopus, which is normally nowhere near this iridescent, it's mostly coated with these white lime particles, but this particular specimen had, oh my gosh, amazing iridescence. And so I did this with my microscope objective setup. I'm not using a microscope per se, but just the objective or the lens, if you will, of the microscope. And this one is about 350 individual photos combined into a single focus stack. And I think that's the end of our photos. Yep and the end of our presentation. So we're definitely happy to answer any questions that you might have. I just wanna say one last thing about this photo because it's so incredible is that um, even for, for me, I've spent you know a long time spending, uh, you know, turning my attention towards these organisms in the field and seeing photos like this primes me. It gets me ready to see this kind of organism again and to be even more excited about it. And there's this funny feedback loop that happens when you spend time paying attention, making a photo of an organism, succeeding, making a really beautiful image that people see, um, you get even more excited to re-encounter it and see that beauty again. So this, this feedback loop of, of, you know, you're trying to bring the beauty to other people, but it also makes those organisms even more beautiful for you next time you see them. Um, yes. I really like that effect of, of spending time on, on, portraiture. Okay, so I, now's the time for questions, I think. Do we have Q&A questions or, or are they in the we chat? Don't have any, uh, we have been asked, you know, they we've been answering questions while this has been going oh, on. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and actually, I did see a question earlier that I wanted to answer. I don't see it in the chat, but somebody asked a question earlier about do I use the focus stacking capability of the camera? So cameras that have focus stacking abilities and uh, the best way to get into focus stacking is to, to get, there's an inexpensive camera, the one that Christian mentioned, the Olympus TG Tough. It's up to, I don't know, TG7 or something. There's a 654, et cetera. And they have focus stacking built within the camera. So you can either have the camera 
take all the photos and then the camera will actually use software internal to the camera and create the composite photo or you can have the camera take all the photos and then you take those photos onto your computer and use software to combine them so uh, all of the camera manufacturers these days have cameras that do both i don't do the focus stacking in the camera i tend to do that at on my computer because I have a lot more control. So I, I did see that question before. And it's not out of the question to stack images that come out of your phone. I have focus stacked images from my phone for various different reasons, um, and it can be really useful. Um, so the there is no real sort of like uh, <laughs> inappropriate use of the technology. If you decide that it is something that, that will serve your goal, um, you can mix and match between sort of sophisticated and advanced techniques and very basic equipment. You guys have been incredibly thorough um, and, you know, in answering all these questions, questions have come up and, you know, without a doubt, you guys have answered them right away. Um, we do have a, a participant that wants to know if they're not able to get out to Madeline Island, where would they be able to find out where else you are teaching? All right. Do you have well, websites? Um, you... Yeah, let me let me start. Uh, just answer the teaching question directly. I don't actually teach a lot because I really prefer to be out in the field. Um, but Madeline Island is so special um, and it's a really in-depth class. I have a lot more fun doing that. So I do give uh, talks occasionally, but I'm really slowing down on doing that, discovering that my passion is mostly to be in the field. Um, Matt, uh, I don't know if I'm, I hope I'm allowed to say this, but Madeline Island is hoping to open up a new campus in California. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if that's in 2025 or something like that. And if that's the case, I think there's a good chance that Christian and I would be, since we both live in California, that we would be teaching that class in California. So that's one way. Um, both Christian and I are on Instagram as well as social media. And if you go on to the Madeline Island webpage, under the instructor bios, you'll find uh, our social media links. And that is definitely the best way to find out about any classes that I'm teaching. Um, I, I'm not enough of a uh, entrepreneur to run my own website. So I rely on having this platform that just allows me to say what I'm doing when I'm doing it. So it's, it's definitely the best way to stay on top of my teaching offerings. Um, there is from Fred, one of our participants. Um, thank you for that, uh, Christian um, and Allison. There is someone is interested in um, uh, if you are interested, do you have any interest in having a short evening session on complementary light microscopy since LM observations really help with fungal mixos natural? Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> yes. So that is something that if we start planning now to do, we could certainly do something about. Um, we can have uh, a little bit of equipment shipped um, ahead of time. And although I don't think it will be the focus of a lot of time during the class, I have made image composites and image overlays, sort of collages um, that incorporate light microscopy. Um, and that can tell an even more compelling story about a mushroom and its ecological interactions. Um, I will actually highlight an example of that during one of the days in class, showing that uh, the truly microscopic features of the mushroom, its spores and its, its cystidia, which you could never see even using Allison's ultra macro techniques, but you can with a light microscope, actually result in a texture that is visible to the naked eye. And so you sort of move between scales all the way from habitat to the organism itself to its microscopic constituents. All of it is just different shapes um, that interact. Um, evolution is operating on the shapes of the organism to make it fit the environment. And, and we can find different ways to highlight those at different scales. OK, and Fred just added uh, that he can bring uh, scopes with setups. That would be terrific, Fred. Um, oh, we're so going to have Fred a lot is, of fun. <laughs> Fred is a slime old expert, and I'm hoping that he comes to the class. And uh, yeah, Fred, if you want to bring scopes, that would be absolutely fantastic. We can use uh, scopes not only to look at the characteristics of mushrooms, but also um, slime mold ID, maybe, oh, I don't know, I'm going to make a rough guess here, maybe 20% of them or so can be identified from a, 
a good photograph, but for the vast majority, you need to look at microscopic characteristics that um, are really fun to see under the microscope. So yes, Fred, please come and please bring scopes. Absolutely. Yeah, and I've actually done quite a bit of um, teaching on microscopy. That is not something that we had talked about doing for this class, but I have led microscope, basic microscope, as well as sort of intermediate identification using microscopes. So I would love for us to be able to do a little bit of that if people want it. Super. That's wonderful. I'm not sure if this is um, something you guys want to answer on here, but um, a, a participant is wondering, um, they just recently got a macro lens and they find that it zooms. Uh, do you see that question, uh, Allison? Yeah, I, let me read it here. I think maybe if you read it, it might be a little Okay, well, what, one maybe thing I'm, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna guess here, depending on the size of your mushroom and how close or far your lens is, the depth of field is small, so you won't get the entire organism in focus. Um, if you go on to either my Instagram or Facebook account, you'll find a link to an article on focus stacking that will probably answer a lot of your questions. It's a free article online. And then I'm actually looking at the chat or the Q&A right now. There's a fellow from or a person from uh, Brazil. Yeah, who's invited you to do this in Brazil? I would love to do that. Absolutely love to do that. What do you think? Judy Rachel? also was wondering, um, Allison, if you would consider doing this uh, program up in Maine in Bar Harbor. What is the what's the uh, climate like there? Christian, you want to address this one? I mean, we have yeah. to be there during mushroom season. Yeah, I was actually in Maine uh, last, uh, I guess it was early summer. And then I was there the year before in fall. And there is spectacular mushrooming to be had in Maine. And I can't imagine that we wouldn't have excellent opportunities to do the same thing there. So yeah, uh, I would encourage Allison, go do that. <laughs> Super, thank you so much, Christian, for answering that. And yes. Uh, so so the, sorry, the same question. Christian would love Brazil. to come to Brazil. <laughs> right, so I was gonna say the same, I would love to come to Brazil. Um, I actually had, uh, met a couple of folks, my colleagues from Brazil who were visiting California for a year and they showed me some photos and they're just stunning um and you know in terms of the best time of year the best time of year is is when you have the most uh, mush mushroom and slime mold diversity which actually depending where you are in the brazil is probably all year so we can uh, you can contact us uh, via our web pages happy to talk to you thank you allison well i think i'm going to wrap this up right now this has been absolutely fascinating um i have learned so much and the pictures that you have created and the feedback and the suggestions of what kind of equipment to bring have been incredible um i can't thank the two of you enough for your time and and thank you to all the 43 participants that took time out of their sunday um i'm sure they appreciated you guys and and the feedback and the information that they gave you um just as a reminder, this date for this workshop on Madeline Island is September 9th to the 13th. It is the height of mushroom season on Madeline Island. So again, I think there was something like 40 new species that were found last year. Um, I can't wait to find out, you know, what else you're going to find this year. Um, and if they want to go ahead and sign up for this workshop, they can just go to madelineartschool.com and look up um, either Christian's or um, Allison's. Um, and you'd be able to pull it from the drop down box and there's still some spots available. Um, any last words from the two of you guys? Yeah, I just want to say if, if people come up with questions they have about the class after this webinar, again, you can contact either Christian or me through uh, messages on our social media accounts. Yeah. We're very quick to answer. Yeah, you've been wonderful. Thank you so much again for all of your time. And thank you for everyone else. Um, you know, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And um, hopefully we will all meet again soon. Thanks yeah. again. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye, everyone. everyone.